everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Shifu Mark Lee. He's a first-generation inheritor of Xinyi Dao, which is a system developed by his father, Grandmaster Lee Tai Leong. And today we're going to ask him about the origins, concepts, and philosophies of Xinyi Dao. Mark, thanks for joining me today. Okay, thank you, Bill. So we'll get deep into the background of Xing Yi Dao in just a minute, but um, in brief, if you had to describe the art to someone who didn't know anything about it, how would you describe Xing Yi Dao? Well, Xing Yi Dao is a synthesis of uh, Xing Yi, Bagua, Tai Chi, and also uh, uh, Chinese uh, free sparring, Chinese kickboxing. Uh, all combined into one system. So it has both the internal component and also the application, the self-defense aspect from, uh, you know, Chinese kickboxing. Okay, great. Sounds interesting. So this, this system was developed by your father, Grandmaster Li Tai Leong. Yes. Um, he, uh, he was from Shanxi province originally, correct? Right. He's from Shanxi province, uh, Taigu County. So Taigu County is the original place where uh, Xing Yi Chuan started. Yes. And and he learned uh, Xing Yi from his father, correct? Yeah, he learned Xing Yi from my grandfather, uh, Li Shichuan. And my grandfather, he learned from Bu Xueguan, uh, who is, uh, he, you know, inheritor of uh, Xing Yi Chuan, Che style Xing Yi Chuan. Che yes. style. Yes. And he also, uh, in that same time period when he was living in China, learned Xinyi, the Dai family Xinyi. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's right. So he learned uh, also Dai style Xinyi Chen because uh, in uh, Shanxi province, so Taigu is the original place where Xinyi Chen started, right? Xinyi Chen is the, the trans, translator as uh, shape, uh, intent, fist, right? Uh, or form intent fist, whereas the original style Xing Yi Quan, it means the heart intent or heart mind fist, right? So, and Taigu is the place where uh, Xing Yi Quan, the, the older, I mean, the the more modern style emerged in Taigu County, and the uh, Qixian County is where the Dai family, they, you know, taught people within the the qi xian the the qi village right the dai style xin quan right so and qi xian and taigu they're very close they're like next to each other okay so so therefore you know some practitioners xin yi practitioners in in taigu county they also you know learned uh dai style xin yi quan because they're so close yes yeah, so so my dad he you know studied uh dai style xin yi quan from two teachers Okay, he studied from uh, Zhao Shouyun, uh, one of the Dai style uh, Xing Yi teachers, and also uh, Wang Yinghai, you know, it's uh, uh, another famous uh, Dai style practitioner. So that was just a natural thing for Xing Yi practitioners in that area to do is to study Xing Yi as well? Yeah, because, you know, Xing Yi comes from Xing Yi. Right. Right, so therefore, when you learn Xing Yi, when you get to a certain level in your Xing Yi practice, it's just natural to, you know, to continue and to go deeper and to go for the origin where the, which is the Dai Style Xing Yi Quan. That makes sense. And so, what was how old was he when he? I, I imagine he began learning this very early on in his life, right? Yeah. So Xing Yi, he started when he was four or five years old. You know, he studied with when my grandfather, right? And also he joined the the team, like the, the Wushu team uh, in his county, right? So the Wushu team back then, they were, you know, the team was led by Bu Xueguan, right? Which I mentioned earlier, which is, um, you know, my grandfather's Xing Yi teacher. So they were primarily focused on, you know, learning Xing Yi, practicing Xing Yi. And then later, you know, also did uh, Wushu in the team. So the team over time is to build uh, people, you know, to become professional athletes, right? And, but because the teams uh, was in Taigu County, so they also have a strong focus on Xing Yi Quan, not just on Wushu. Interesting. Yes. 
And your father also learned Shaolin style Kung Fu from his grandfather, right? Is that yes. Correct? Yeah. Right. So my grandfather, you know, not only that he did uh, Xing Yi Quan, he also did uh, Shaolin Kung Fu. Yes, which is complementary to to Xing Yi Quan. And yeah. also, if you look at uh, you know Dai style Xing Yi Quan, if you really trace back to the the origin, you, you know, the person who created you know the the Xing Yi uh, fist. It be, originally was called Xin Yi Liu He, the Six Harmony Xin Yi Fist, right? And he was a spear master, right? He's already well known for his spear skill. And then he went to Shaolin Temple, right, to further his practice. And, and in Shaolin Temple, he merged, you know, the his uh, skill that he already has in spear training, and also, you know, the Buddhist. Uh, practice, you know, Kung Fu practice, and, and created the, the Xin Yi Liu He, the Six Harmony Xin Yi. Yes. So your father had a very solid foundation, and then he also went on to study Bagua with some very impressive teachers, too. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, you know, as uh, from Shanxi province, right, he was in the team, and he trained all his life, you know, since he was five years old, he joined the team. And, uh, you know, at the age, uh, you know, when he turned to, you know, 18 years old, right? And, you know, he went on to Beijing and where he uh, joined, he was uh, accepted into the Beijing Sports University. That's like the number one sports university in China. And he was accepted into the Wushu uh, department. Right, where he studied uh, both uh, modern wushu and also Chinese kickboxing, Sanda. Right, and while he was in Beijing, uh, he also, you know, went on, you, you know, in Beijing to look for, you know, teachers that do internal martial arts. Right, so he found, you know, a good teacher to study uh, Bagua Zhang. Right, so that that's why he was still in the university training wushu, training Chinese Chinese kickboxing, and then he studied uh, bagua zhang with uh, Master Wang Rongtang. That's yes. a Chang style bagua, correct? Yeah, Chang style bagua. Yes. And didn't he also studied uh, bagua from uh, Zhang Fengjing? Uh, Zhang Fengjing. And that style of bagua is very unfamiliar to most people in the West, as it's a um, Supposed to be a pre Dong Hai Chuan style of Bagua, like an old older style, Taoist style Bagua. Is that right, correct? Right. Yes, that, that that's right. So the the you know the old style Bagua, the Taoist Bagua, you know they don't have you know like what we see nowadays with forms, you know this form and that form, you know like uh, basic eight palms, old eight palms, and forty six palms. It was just practice. You know, practice of walking the circles, but it's different from you know the modern way of walking walking the circles. You don't just completely just go around in circles. You have you, you know each step you you take, you have to turn the body towards the the center of the pole, and then you have to also each step that you take, you have to lift your foot up. So it's different from you know what we see nowadays with Bagua. So not like not at all like the sort of mud stepping style that you see in Bagua. Right, way. it's not mud stepping. Yeah, it's closer to closer to uh, Xin Yi stepping. That the the original Dai style Xin Yi stepping is closer closer to that. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. So he your your dad already had uh, he was exposed to a lot of different martial arts and he had a. Um, access to a lot of very talented martial arts teachers then at the Beijing Sports University. Yes, that's right. Was was this a, the 1980s, early 1980s? Is that the time period that we're talking about here? Uh, he joined the Sports University in 1977. 77, oh, okay. Yes. And uh, I believe he also studied, in addition to Chinese, like Sanda, or kickboxing, he studied a little bit of um, Western-style boxing there too, correct? Yeah, they tell the, you know, because it's in this Beijing Sports University, right? So they have different departments. So yeah. they have Wushu department where the focus is on performance Wushu. And he was one of the, the few 
uh, people there that were selected to do uh, Chinese kickboxing to do sundown, right? Not many people, you know, were had the privilege to to learn. You know, primarily in the wushu department at the time was the focus was on performance wushu, right? And he was one of, one of the few that were selected to do sanda. And also because you know they have other departments, they have. Uh, boxing, you know, Western boxing. So, you, you know, he already, he also trained there too, you know, uh, some uh, Western boxing. But his focus at the time was, uh, you know, wushu and uh, Chinese kickboxing. So at, at what point did he start to formulate the idea of a synthesis of these different arts um, into Xin Yi Dao? Was that something that he was thinking about from a young age or did it, ah, sorry, excuse me, did that happen at the sports university or was it later on? Uh, yes, later on in, in his life, you know, probably I would say in the early 1990s, you, you know, he started thinking about, uh, you know, not just him, but also, you know, his Kung Fu brothers, you know, in, in Taigu, right? So, you know, they, they're very close. Uh, that they they don't train from the same teacher, but you know they grew up together. They they trained a lot together. So you, you know they were talking about you know creating, you know, uh, the system. You know because you know Master Li he knows different arts, and uh, also his uh, kung fu brother uh, Master Yang Fansheng. You know he also has his uh, knowledge not only in Xing Yi in the original Xin Yi, also in Chinese wrestling and, uh, you know, long fist. So they're thinking, you know, with all their knowledge, how to put together into a system, right? Where, you know, it's more than just internal martial arts, right? Also, you know, boxing, kickboxing uh, combined. And so, you know, as they were, they were discussing, you know, they came up with this idea, you know, of Xin Yi Dao, right, which is the way of the the heart and mind. Interesting. That's one of the benefits, I think, of having a good uh, Kung Fu brothers, sisters, practice partners, is that you get to try out what works and what doesn't and right. you know, come up with your own ideas. Yes, that's right. <laughs> So this was in the early 1990s, and your dad ended up coming to the U.S. in 1996, somewhere around that point. Right, 1996, he came to the to the U.S. and he started the teaching, and then he started, you know, promoting the uh, Xin Dao system, right? And uh, over time, you know, uh, over time he refined, you know. The, the Xin Yi Dao system, you know, that the more he, he teaches, the more he practices, the more understanding he has, that the deeper understanding he has. And, you know, it's just a, a constant process of refinement. So it's evolving all the time. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's good. That's a sign of a healthy martial art, I think. <laughs> yes. So can you describe for us the... Um, journey of a beginning student in Xin Yi Dao, if someone comes to your school to study, let's say maybe they don't have any martial arts experience or not much, what is the beginning curriculum like? What are, what are some of the things that they can expect from the very beginning? Okay, so from the very beginning, right, you have to do uh, things that are more dynamic, right? Internal are usually slower, right? Because it's, things are going on more on the inside. But, you know, Master Li, because of his background in wushu, in Chinese kick, kickboxing, he doesn't start people with stance training, right? He starts people with, you know, exercises, you know, kicks, like wushu kicks. And he teaches people the basics, how to throw punches, how to throw kicks, right? Uh, and that's in Chinese kickboxing. And then he would teach students how to do a uh, senti stance, Right, because that, that's the core, you know, stance training in Xing Yi Quan, right? So, you know, teaching people how to do senti stance and then teaching people how to walk the circles, okay, in Bagua. And, uh, and gradually, you, you know, over time uh, to teach them how to do like, for example, the five element fists, how to do the, the palms, the basic palms and, um, 
Uh, and also if students, they, they want to go deeper into understanding the system, then Master Li would teach them, you know, how to do squatting monkey, which is the core uh, Nei Gong training for uh, the Dai style Xing system. Uh, and then how to do like the Dai style five elements. And so that that's like a progression. Right. And without that, you know, everything you, you learn, there's little bit of everything, wow. right? There's a little bit of Shaolin Kung Fu. And um uh Masterly he developed a, a form, it's called Five Tiger Form, which is based on a combination of Shaolin Kung Fu, uh Long Fist and Xing Yi. And uh and then also you know, teaching students how to you know, do some sanda, you know, depending on your age. So if you're younger, so he's going to teach you uh, more sanda. So if you're a bit older, he's going still going to ask you to, to do it, but with less intensity. Right. So there's a little bit of everything right from the beginning. It's not yeah, sort of like right. you just concentrate on one thing and then that's interesting. Yeah. So his idea, you, you know, uh, that the way he teaches is, you, you know, he doesn't think that, you know, it's a good idea to start people, you know, purely the internal training. So one, one thing is that, you, you know, people may lose interest, you, you know, if they don't understand what it is that they're doing. And second, it takes a lot of time, right, to build the, the internal uh, mechanics uh, of the body, right? So if people don't have the patience to, to do that, you know, it's better to start them with something that, you know, they understand is more direct, you know, for them to have a, you know, good understanding because it's very direct. And over time, as they get better and they feel that they need to go deeper into the internal component, then, you know, the uh, master Lee would teach them, you know, more uh, internal stance training, squatting monkey and things like that. That's not all that different than the way a lot of people progress. Uh, well, I know in my own life and a lot of people that I know, you know, when we were younger, maybe we did Shaolin Kung Fu or something like that. And then as we started to get older, we got more into, you know, Xing Yi, Bagua. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and so, that's how I learned, you know, yeah. with, with my dad. I didn't start uh, learning the internal until, you know, I'm ready to learn. So I started doing Wushu first and then did Chinese kickboxing you know, and then as I get a little bit older, I, you know, I became more serious into the internal training, you know, and earlier as I was younger, I was just learning the forms that there's not so much internal component involved, just doing the, the Xing Yi forms, right, doing the Bagua forms, but more focused on, you know, Chinese kickboxing, right, and uh, as I get a bit older, I, you know, mentally, I, became more mature and that's when I get really interested in the internal component. Yeah, I think that's what happens to all of us. And then once we get interested in the internal component, we wish we'd done it when we were younger, but of course we that's probably right. wouldn't, have, wouldn't have understood. It would have been wasted that's on it. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, I, I know that you've written quite a bit about uh, modern combatives like boxing and kickboxing and things like that. And, and you've, you've talked about the difference between, for instance, uh, posture in traditional martial arts, you know, we're keeping the head very upright and, and how that is not necessarily the best thing to do when you're in a fight with somebody. Right, right. Um, so when you, when you're teaching your new students and, you know, people that are completely new to martial arts, do you emphasize from the very beginning that this is combat and, and this is cultivation? Do you, do you talk to them about the difference right off the bat? Yeah, um, I, I do talk to them about the the differences, you know, right from the, the beginning, right, to have them understand, right, what is cultivation, right, what is uh, practical martial arts, right? And, you know, many of the principles from both the competitive, combative side and also the cultivation side, they're similar, you know, particularly the body mechanics, right? There, there's a lot of similarity to it. But, you know, uh, from, let's say if you learn Xing Yi or Bagua, right? And then you want to learn how to fight, you need to make some adjustments, yeah. right? 
and um, and depending on the style that that you do, right? The internal style you do. Some styles they're more open. They're focused more on opening the body. Some styles are more focused on closing the body, compressing the body. For example, the the dai style Xing is focused very much on compressing the body, right? And if you watch, you know, boxing or, or kickboxing, right? Yeah, you know, boxers or kickboxers they have to keep their body compact. Right, so when they get hit, when there's impact, they can absorb that impact. So if your body is like this, like say in stance training, and or or you do tai chi and you get so used to keeping the body open, right? When you 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 know go into fighting, you know combative side, right? Your body are not going to get used to that. So you have to adjust yourself, right, in order to get used to, to the fighting aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's good that you teach that way. I know that a lot of, um, I'm not, I say a lot, some traditional teachers nowadays will say something along the lines of, uh, you know, you can take Xingyi or you can take Bagua, but this is really for your health. Um, and you, if you want to only learn to fight, you would be better off doing something like Muay Thai or boxing or something like that. But of course, you know, people fought with Xingyi and Bagua for many, many years and it worked just fine. It's just the way that you train and in, in you have to know what you're training for, right? Right. I, I mean, on this particular issue, I mean, it's a big topic. Yeah. Right. Like there's a lot of discussions about, you know, what's the use of internal martial arts? Right. Yeah. It just seems like, you know, internal martial arts could not find its place. You know, what, what is internal martial arts? The internal martial arts is many things, right? It's health, right? I mean, both physical and mentally. Yeah, right? absolutely. And it's uh, internal cultivation, Right, working with the breath, working with the chi, right, working with the dentian, right, and also internal martial arts is, you know, it's developed because it's a martial art, yeah. right. You have to, to fight fight with it, yeah, and um, and and then people bring in boxing and kickboxing and and you know as you know with evidence with factual evidence, you know, boxing and kickboxing they are clearly better in terms of fighting, right? They're more direct and it's easier, you learn faster and all the techniques are, are more direct. Whereas the internal martial arts, whatever technique you learn, you have to modify it, you know, to be able to use it effectively. So that's not a very direct way of, of learning things. So like boxing, you throw a punch and you throw a punch, right? right? You don't learn to throw a punch and then when you fight, you modify it. Yeah. You, you know, it, it just wouldn't, you, you know, it doesn't work properly, you know, effectively in such a way. And my opinion on this issue is that, you know, with internal martial arts, it's developed like 300 years ago, let's say two, 300 years ago. And at the time, people's understanding of fighting is different than people's understanding of, of fighting nowadays, right? Yeah. Just if you look at boxing. Right, when boxing first started, first developed, right, you see the postures, right? Like boxers, they were holding the posture like this, fists like yeah. this. And nowadays you don't see boxers holding their, their fists like this, they're like this, yeah. right? So there is evolution, yeah. right? And internal martial arts developed two, 300 years ago, right? At the time, maybe, you know, their understanding of fighting techniques were sufficient. Right. Right. And and, you know, to today, maybe it's not sufficient. It, it, so there's, a, you know, competitive martial arts have has evolved. Yeah. Right. So nowadays we have uh, mixed martial arts. Right. Everything has evolved. So to be able to to fight in the cage, you need to be a complete martial artist. Right. You have to know everything, boxing, kickboxing, uh, jujitsu, grappling and, and all that. So I just feel like for internal martial arts, you know, to be able to, you know, to be effective in, in the modern sense of fighting, you know, it has to evolve. Yeah, I agree. Uh, do you teach uh, ground fighting at your school? Is that something that's part of the curriculum there? Uh, I teach a, a little bit of, of ground fighting. You know, my interest is not in ground fighting. So, you know, I'm not an expert in ground fighting. I, I did learn some Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, when I was in, in college, 
And, uh, you know, I, I met a, a very good uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach, you know, who comes to my college to 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 teach a little bit, you know, uh, free of charge. And, oh, and the way he does his uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu techniques is like, you know, doing internal martial arts training. It's like doing Tai Chi, you know, very relaxed. And there's a lot of sensitivity training involved. And I had, uh, you know, very good experience uh, learning from this person. But, uh, you know, my interest overall, you know, is internal martial arts. So, it, you know, I focus more on what I know, which is internal martial arts and Chinese kickboxing. And Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, I teach a little bit of, you know, ground techniques just for people to be aware, like, you know, what happens when you're taken down, like, how do you protect yourself? Right or or what do you do to to make sure that you don't get taken down? Yeah, right. On the fence and how to get back up as fast as you can. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, you mentioned well, we talked about the cultivation side a little bit and breath and the development of the dantian. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that side of Shin Yi Dao, the meditative aspect, the health yes. aspect? Yes, that that's right. So the thing about you know internal martial arts, I, I like to bring out this uh, conversation is that, you know, when people do internal martial arts, when they first start learning internal martial arts, it doesn't really mean that they're doing internal, right? Because, you know, in the beginning of the learning process, there's no internal, right? You can breathe, you can imagine things, but it's not real, right? Imagination is not real, right? right? So what people start doing when they do internal martial arts is they're really doing just external martial arts. They learn the moves, Right. They learn the stance training. They try to have a, a good posture, you, you know, in their stance training and then the movement they try to copy along. And that's external martial arts. Right. So and then, you know, over time, as you become better, maybe you internalize the movements of your external movements. OK, what I mean by that, internalizing the external movements, meaning that external movements, you use more strength, muscular strength, right, to power your movements, right, to, to generate strength. In Chinese, it's called li, gen, generating li, generating strength, right? And as you get better, you start to think, OK, this is stupid strength, right? That the more strength I apply, yes, it, it may work. You, you can outpower people if you're stronger than other people. Right, but at some point you understand, right? There are people that are bigger than you. There are people that are stronger than you. What do you do about that, right? So your strength from your muscular training may not be sufficient, right? So then you start, you know, looking deeper into the internal martial arts body mechanics. And, and then over time, some practitioners may start to understand this concept of internalizing uh, their external movements meaning that they don't just rely completely on their muscular strength. What they do, they start to feel, oh, in the, in the, in the body, in the anatomy, there's the, the tendons, there's the, the bones, and then, you know, we talk about also this term fascia, right? So, so it means that uh, you start to, right, when you start to, to feel these things in your body, you start to rely less on muscles, right? And you start to rely more on your tendon strength, on your bone strength, right? On your fascia, right? And, and when you, you, you know, get to that stage, right, where, you know, you feel like you use less muscular strength, right? You use less to achieve more. Right. And so that's internalized movement. Right. So and also, you know, when you start to internalize your, your movements, right, you become more efficient. Right. You use less strength to achieve better results. OK. And also using purely muscular strength is hard strength. And, you know, according to Taoist understanding of the nature of the universe, right? The yin yang theory is that when you're really hard, it's easy to break, yeah. right? But if you're really soft, it's also easy to break, right? So internalizing 
the action of movements doesn't mean that you just become soft, that there's no strength. There is strength, there is force, but it's an alternative strength, alternative force, where you're using your tendons, you're using your fascia, you're using your, the bones to generate strength, right? And with that type of internalized movements, your body also become more elastic, right? So the, the concept of e elasticity is something that I stress very uh, importantly in my teaching, right? Because hard things break easily. If you take a stick and you hit something really hard, right? That also has a hard surface, the brick, the, the stick is going to break. And that thing is also going to get damaged whatever you're, you're hitting the stake with, right? And as you become internal, more internalized, right? Your body become more elastic. So it's like a rubber band, you, you know? So then when you use a rubber band or you use a whip to hit things, it doesn't break. It, it doesn't mean that, you, you know, you, you don't have strength, you have strength. It's just that it's more adaptable. It's more elastic, okay? And, uh, and so that's internalized movements, right? And also internalized movements also leads to internal movements, right? So internal movements has to, to do with the breath, right? Has to do with the mind, the E, right? So the connection of the breath and the mind, right? Is what causes your dantian to develop, right? Your dantian is the, the area, right? Uh, at your abdominal, it's your abdominal area, right? So there's a, a space that you can develop, like a storage room, right? So without the, the breath and connecting the breath with your, your E, you're, you're not able to develop this storage place called Dantian, right? So Dantian starts out as a concept, but over time, when you're able to properly connect the breath and the, the mind, the E, is dantian will emerge, right? It's your abdominal area on the inside is going to create space and where you can use that, use that space, that, that force that's stored in that space to, to generate strength, to turn that into strength or into power, right? So to me, I think it's very important for any internal martial arts practitioners to have an understanding of what it is that they're learning and the progression, right? From external movements to internalized movements to internal movements, right? So when you get to the deeper level of internal movement, right? Able to power your, your movements with your, your dantian. Dantian is like an engine of a car, right? And to, to do that, Okay, you need to go through the process of external, internalized, and internal. And that the internal stage, it doesn't mean that you don't use your body anymore, right? Dantian cannot do anything if your body doesn't, you know, create the, your, your body doesn't execute the techniques, right? So your body still have to, to be, you, you know, your body need to execute those techniques using internalized force, right? Using the, the tendons, using the fascia, and then the dantian is going to add more power to it. And in Chinese, uh, you know, martial arts writing, like if you read the, the menus, like the training menus, right? They, they talk about what is internal martial arts, like a, a very brief sentence, okay? And, you know, many people may have overlooked that that particular, you know, thing that that you know people write about that internal martial arts has two components: the you know physical component, the external component, and the internal component. Okay, so the external component they say, uh, "Wai lian jing gu pi." So externally, okay, you are training your tendons, you are training your bones and you're training your skin or muscle, right? And internally, they say in Chinese, 内练一口气, meaning that internally, you're training this one breath. So the one breath, they're talking 
about you know the connection of the the breath the e right in order to uh create right the the dantian in the body and be able to to use that so so internal martial arts is not just qi it's not just dantian right it's both internal and external because there's the the body right <laughs> so there's dantian force right and there's the the action or the the bones the tendons force yeah absolutely i it, it's a entertaining sometimes when you see new people coming to internal martial arts and they think that internal means that there's no sweating or uh, <laughs> involved right right <laughs> there's a lot of physical training something. involved right yeah, yeah absolutely or you're doing something wrong <laughs> yes so you have a lot of students. Uh, what What is your own training like? Uh, your personal training. Uh, you know, you have you spend a lot of time teaching. What is your own personal training like at this stage in your development? Well, for me, my training is very boring. You, you know, it's like I just focus on one thing, right? Uh, I mean, depending on the mood of the day. Yeah. Right. You know, maybe I just do. Bagua circle walking, you know, maybe I do senti stance or maybe Hun Yuan stance or, you know, any other Tai Chi stance, right? Or maybe I do squatting monkey. Okay. And, uh, you know, fundamentals. Yeah. So <laughs> you know? The, the beginning techniques, there are the advanced techniques at the end of the day. Yeah. 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 People, you know, a lot of people, they get into internal martial arts and they train for a for some time, they asked, you know, what is the secret? Like people are constantly, you know, looking for what is the secret? And, you know, and it's a natural mentality because when you're learning, you always think that, you know, your teacher is hiding something from you. You, you know, that, that how come, how come I'm not as good as my teacher? You, you know, like well, what it is that, that I'm not getting, you, you know, how do I get to my, my teacher's skill level? Right. And, um, you, you know, you know, I, I'm in a different position, you know, because my, my dad, he teaches me everything he knows. So yeah. there, there's no such, you, you know, um, thing that, that for me to think about what is the secret, you know, whatever he trains, I'll, I'll train with him. Yeah. Right. And it always come down to to the fundamentals. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a good advice for anybody, I think. How many Shinyi Dao schools are there? You have, um, yes, so you know, uh, we have schools here, uh, in New York, right, on Long Island, New York City, uh, Manhattan, right, and also in Virginia, Maryland, and uh, West Coast, uh, in California, and also, uh, Washington State, Seattle area, right? So, you know. Uh, East Coast and West Coast, right? Um, actually, he has disciples, you know, in different states that they're teaching. Do you, um, you, you travel and give seminars at some of these places, right? Yeah, sometimes I do go out and give seminars. I, yeah, it used to be my dad, you know, he goes out there to, to give seminars. Now he, he's getting older. Yeah. Right. He, he doesn't like to, to teach that much anymore. Right. It's more about self-cultivation. Right. So he's just, uh, you, you know, allowing me to take on this uh, task, you know, to teach. And, and do you ever teach? Do you ever do seminars at schools other than Xin Yi Dao schools? Have you ever been invited to another like style school and teach there? Yeah, I have. I have been invited to other schools, you know, who, you know, who want to know what what is Xin Yi Dao. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, because to, to me, Xin Yi Dao is quite unique because it's a combination of, of many things and has a strong, you know, internal base from Dai style uh, Xin Yi Quan, okay, which is a, a rare style. It's the original style is rare. Even, even in China, uh, you know, the, there's, you, you can rarely find anybody who teaches uh Dai style Xin Yi. Um, you know, if you go to Shanxi, you know, you still can find, you know, unless you, you go to Qi Xian Qi village, or maybe if you go to Taigu, which is 
you know, a uh, neighbor to uh, Qi County. So you can find some, you know, teachers, practitioners, you, you know, so it's a very rare, rare style. And, and even if you go go there to, to find a teacher, you know, you may be able to find a teacher. Then another issue is, are they willing to teach you? You, you know, if they don't know you, they, they won't teach you. Yeah. So, so I think it's just interesting. I mean, it doesn't matter what martial arts you do, you know, to have some experience to, you know, the Dai style Xing Yi to the, you know, as the foundation to the Xing Yi Dao system. I think it's just, just good, you know, to broaden your experience, your understanding of internal martial arts. So we talked a little bit earlier where you said that you not uh, internal martial arts seems to have a hard time finding its place. And uh, one of the questions that I've been asking everybody that I've interviewed is, what do you think is the future of internal martial arts? Where, where do you think that this is going? What's Oh, I think internal martial arts is going in the direction of, of health. Health, yeah. You know, physical health and, and mental health, right? And, um, you know, because... Like I said earlier, I, I find that internal martial arts as a, you know, as a martial art, as a practical art, you know, is outdated. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, the training itself is good, right? The internal training, right? Uh, it, it's, it's very good, but you have to, to learn the, the modern way of fighting, right? In order to really, you know, say that I'm a martial artist. Right. Otherwise, if you just do internal martial arts and you're isolated from modern understanding of, of combative martial arts, then you, it, it's not really martial arts. Right. It's, it's like, you, you know, you can you can take a weapon, right? You can take a knife, you can take a spear, you can take a staff, you can fight with it. But if somebody has a, has a handgun or machine gun, it's just not going to work. Right. Be a bad day. Yes. No, but I think it's very admirable that you and your father, um, you know, are uh, teach teach the combative aspect and the internal aspect and the health aspect because you know that that allows there to be something for everybody because not everyone comes to martial arts for for the same reasons, um, but they should know what they're learning. They should know what they're getting when they learn. Yeah, I think you know in my teaching, uh, it's a matter of choice. You know, whoever comes to me to learn, right? I you, you know I try to give them a complete understanding of what it is that they're learning and what do they want to develop, right? Do, do they want to uh, develop as a martial artist to be able to fight or do they want to focus more on health, uh, you, you know, or, or they just want to learn forms. There's people that just want to learn forms. You know, they, they don't uh, care whether the movements are, are going to work or, or not. Yeah, realistically speaking, right? They 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 just like to do forms, and some people they just like to do qigong, right? They, you know, breathing, internal stance training, right? And some people they they just want to fight. You know, they they learn internal martial arts for the for the purpose of fighting, right? Right. So so then you know, for those that want to learn more about fighting, you know, I don't just teach them internal martial arts. I, I teach them, you know, Chinese kickboxing. So there's something there for everybody, no matter yes. what it is they want to learn. Right. And another thing I like to, um, you know, talk about, you know, within this context is that, you know, from looking at a lot of debates of people that internal martial arts practitioners, right. It's like, like people are generally, uh, are confused what it is that they're getting from internal martial arts. Right. I, I think for a lot of, people when they get into internal martial arts is for the fighting aspect. Yeah. And then after some time learning it, they find it is not so practical and then they lose interest, yeah. right? So this is a common thing when you read like discussion boards or, or Facebook, uh, Facebook groups, right? It's a very common uh, thing that people talk about, right? And I, for me, I just personally think that if you really, I mean, if your purpose in learning any martial arts is to be able to fight, I think internal martial arts is an ineffective 
uh, way of learning how to fight, right? If all you really care about just fighting, go to competitive martial arts, right? Go to boxing, go to kickboxing, go to grappling, jujitsu. That is going to be very direct and you learn on day one how to fight and whatever techniques that you learn, you don't have to modify it. You just use it the way it is. And the, the only thing that you have to think about is the technical aspects. How do you set up your techniques, right? If you want to take somebody down, how do you set up the takedown, right? So you have to throw a punch or throw a kick or throw a combination of punches and kicks. And then in order to dive down to take somebody down, right? Or if you want to throw a kick, how do you set up the kick, right? So, so the techniques themselves, solves, you don't have to modify. It is what it is. Right. right. It's a strategy, right? How do you combine those techniques to get the result that you need, right? Whether to hit somebody, to kick somebody, to take somebody down or to submit somebody, right? And so internal martial arts is very abstract in that sense that any techniques you learn, you have to modify it. And even after you modify it, how do you know it works or not? You don't know. Right. right. And you have to spend a lot of time in training the internal component, right? Do the stance training and all that. And the amount of time that, that you spend on doing the stance training, the amount of time you spend on doing the Tai Chi form or the Bagua form, like all that time, you're not using it to learn how to become effective, you know, martial artist, you know, to learn how to use it. So to me, it's a very ineffective way of learning how to fight. Yeah. Right. But if you want to, you know, learn internal martial arts to have, you know, some understanding of, you know, fighting techniques and also think about your health, right? And think about to make your body stronger and think about how to cultivate your body. That's, you know, internal martial arts. Yeah, I think that the the value is, is in the uh, in the longevity of them. You know, you you can do internal martial arts till you're very very old. Yes, that's you know, right. Unlike combative arts, you know, your combative arts uh, career is going to be relatively short compared to your yes. internal martial arts career. Yeah, that's right. So we're just about out of time. Uh, would you like to tell people where they can find out more about you and your father and your school? Oh, okay. Yeah. So you know. Uh, to learn more about the Xingdao system, uh, they uh, people can visit our website. It's called uh, xingyidaousa.com. It's spelled as X-I-N-Y-I-D-A-O.com, uh, USA.com, xingyidaousa.com, where they can learn about the fundamental principle of, of the Xingdao system and, you know, to to learn where we teach, right? Like, you know, we're primarily based in, in New York, New York City, Long Island, but also there are students in, you know, Virginia, Maryland, and also West Coast, California, Washington. You know, so if anybody's interested to, you know, uh, visit our, our website and contact us. Yeah, it's a very interesting comprehensive system. So I encourage anybody that's interested to check that website out. Um, can you stick around for just a second, Mark? Yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks a lot for joining me today. And on uh, behalf of myself and everyone at Dowie, uh, thanks for watching and enjoy your practice. Mm -hmm.